Okay, so uh, today let us continue our discussion of the definition of creation and annihilation operators in many body physics. So specifically uh, we want to utilize that to uh, define what are called Green's functions. So I already introduced you to you the concepts of uh, particle and whole Green's functions in the last class. So, but one thing I failed to do was uh, I did not explain to you uh, how to uh, consider these operators as uh, being time dependent because normally you associate uh, the concept of operators being time dependent with the Heisenberg picture rather than the Schrodinger picture. So I want to be able to first properly define what it means for an operator to change with time. So that is uh, of course straightforward uh, if you think about it from the perspective of uh, a system with fixed number of particles. So then uh, it is just uh, the unitary evolution times the operator times the inverse. So it is as simple as that. But here also there is something similar but there is a subtle variation in interpretation. So the reason is because. You see if you want to uh, define the time evolution of uh, an operator such as the annihilation operator, it is not that straightforward because you see the annihilation operator changes the number of particles in the system itself. So that is a very drastic thing that it does. So it actually removes a particle from the system. So that is an unusual circumstance you see in uh, if you just think about it. Uh, you will not be able to recollect any example in your undergraduate or uh, MSc class where you studied a quantum mechanical system where a particle was actually removed from the system. Of course, you might think of you know grand canonical statistical mechanics, but that is a statistical uh, system that is mm, that is not what I am talking about. So, if you have a closed system somebody coming and you know picking out a particle and throwing it away and asking what the dynamics will look like from then onwards. You would not have studied that problem although you have to admit that that is an interesting question to study. So uh, the reason why those questions were not addressed of course one, one is would be the lack of time, the other would be that you probably really need this formalism or this sort of machinery and that I am discussing in these uh, classes in order for you to uh, address those questions in a compact and uh, convincing way. So the thing is that uh, if you do not use these, uh, these tools of creation and annihilation operators, answers to such questions become very unwieldy and lengthy and confusing. So the reason why we introduce these operators precisely to make answers to such questions very transparent. Okay, so let me continue my uh, definition of the annihilation operator and how it changes with time. So the way it changes with time uh, clearly is uh, has to be nearly the same as what we normally expect. Namely, if you have an operator uh, in the Heisenberg picture that changes with time by definition is that operator which is sandwiched between the evolution operator on the right side and its inverse. But then keep in mind that the evolution operator clearly involves the Hamiltonian of the system. But the Hamiltonian of the system has a fixed number of particles I mean if you, uh, you have to specify the number of particles before you specify the Hamiltonian. So clearly that Hamiltonian is a function of the number of particles which is why I have uh, written a subscript capital N signifying the number of particles. But then you see the, the moment you um, annihilate, so you are supposed to first uh, evolve the system. So if you want to find the time dependence of the annihilation operator, you are supposed to first evolve the system up to time t dash using a Hamiltonian that contains n particles and then you are supposed to annihilate a particle at position r dash. But then keep in mind that the moment you annihilate a particle you are reducing the number of particles from n to n minus 1. So now when you operate it uh, operate that state by an inverse 
of this evolution operator that inverse now begins to look quite funny because now you see you are supposed to use the Hamiltonian again to perform the uh, inverse of the evolution operator. But which Hamiltonian you see now that you have in, in, annihilated a particle it has one fewer particles than before. So that means you are supposed to now use the Hamiltonian that corresponds to a system with one fewer particles. So which is why I have done this. So this is not what you normally expect when you think of evolution of operators in the Heisenberg picture. It is the same thing here and here. But uh, this is the only exception that when you are dealing with uh, an operator that changes the number of particles you have to keep track of how many particles there are in your system. So you should remind yourself that you have to use the Hamiltonian that contains the right number of particles. So just to drive home this point I have uh, specifically explicitly written down the Hamiltonian containing n particles here and another Hamiltonian containing one fewer particle. But then keep in mind here um, I have uh, arbitrarily chosen to omit the last particle that so the Pn and Rn are removed from the system. I could have uh, chosen to remove P, P1 and R1 instead and that, that would be perfectly valid. And in fact that would also correspond to a system with one fewer particle. So similarly I could have chosen to remove P2 or R2. So basically I could have chosen to remove any particular particle. But I purposely chose to uh, remove the last one just to remind you that uh, you have to do this. Uh, um, you have to remember to do that and that means you have to remember to remove a particle. But now comes the point, so the, the, the point I just made namely that which one should you be removing is now addressed here. So now suppose I want to um, make, so the question is how do you make sense of uh, this operator acting on a wave, after all you know any operator is basically by definition characterized by how it acts. Uh, uh, the behavior of the operator is determined by how it acts on some state. So state is characterized by a wave function. So the answer clearly is the following. Suppose you have a, a wave function with n particles then you act uh, this wave function uh, by a annihilation operator. So that annihilation operator which has been evolved to a time t dash is clearly determined by the unitary time evolution with n particles and then it is inverse with one fewer particle because there is an annihilation in between. Okay, so now uh, when you act this on the wave function containing n particles, so clearly this has a very familiar interpretation and namely that is uh, it is uh, so now this becomes the wave function in the Schrodinger picture which has been evolved from time t equal to 0 up to time t equal to t dash. So that is the uh, that is how you transit from the you know Heisenberg to the Schrodinger picture if you, if you recall your undergraduate quantum mechanics because now this has a clear interpretation of the wave function of a system uh, of uh, n particles well this does this has a wave function of system of n particle which has been evolved from time t equal to 0 up to time t equals t dash. But then what do you do with that wave function? You annihilate a particle at position r dash. So I am going to assume uh, that these wave functions have already been properly symmetrized. I mean it just lengthens our calculations if it has not been done because you are supposed to hit the wave functions with the symmetrization each time to ensure that they get properly symmetrized. So it makes perfect sense to assume that that has been done beforehand. So given that it has been done beforehand you are supposed to now annihilate a particle at r dash and uh, if it has already been done beforehand it it's, uh, it does not matter which one you annihilate because you know I told you that the symmetrization operator which has already been carried out on this wave function uh, democratizes uh, all the coordinates in such a way that uh, it does not make a difference which one you annihilate. So as a result I am going to uh, 
uh, without loss of generality choose to annihilate R n. So, if I annihilate R n, it now becomes R dash. So, uh, having done that, uh, then I am now called upon to, uh, so, so that is the transition here. So, this becomes the Schrodinger interpretation and now R n gets annihilated by R and it becomes this. Now, what I am supposed to do, you see now you stare at this, what is this wave function? It is a wave function with one fewer particles. That means it had n particles to begin with, but it has uh, one fewer particle now. Now what you do is you undo what you did and what did you do earlier? You evolved. You evolved the system from time t equal to 0 to t equal to t dash using the Hamiltonian containing n particles. Now you undo that, that means you de-evolve. But then in order to de-evolve, you have to use the same Hamiltonian, but now all of a sudden you see there is one fewer particle in your system. So that means you are supposed to now de-evolve using a Hamiltonian which has one fewer particles. So which is in other words this one, which is the reason why I chose to omit the last one because see in, in, once you democratize using the symmetrization operator, it makes no difference which one you annihilate. So I preferentially chose the last one without loss of generality and then I end up doing this. So you see now clearly this particular, so once you de-evolve, you end up with a wave function and that wave function has a very specific uh, physical meaning and that is basically the what I call the whole uh, wave function. That means it is a wave function, okay, so let us read this off here. So it basically it says the, the interpretation, so that means if you decide to annihilate a particle at position r dash at time t dash on a state which had initially n particles, you end up with a whole uh, wave function. And what is the meaning of that whole wave function? It is that wave function at time t equal to 0 of n minus 1 variables r1, r2 up to rn minus 1, which when evolved from this time to t equals t dash. So that means it is that wave function which when evolved from this t equal to 0 to t equal to t dash, right, becomes identical to this function. So, and what is this function? This is basically the original function evolved uh, from t equal to 0 up to t equal to t dash and then replace the last one and uh, by r dash. So, so basically that is what it is. So, I am making a big fuss about something that is uh, rather simple to uh, understand if you just think a little bit. So, basically I am just trying to put this in words, I am just trying to you know verbalize these equations which is not always a good idea. But uh, so basically this is what it is, it basically represents a system with a hole, but then that hole has been propagating. So the point is that it, that is a hole is a function of time t dash, so it depends on at what time you create the hole, so it is parameterized by t dash. So basically you are creating a hole in your system and that hole is parameterized by t dash because that is the, the time at which you are creating a hole. And that uh, hole wave function clearly contains one fewer particle than what you had earlier because you have annihilated. Okay, so now that uh, I have uh, rigorously uh, justified what it means to evolve creation and annihilation operators with time, that is the Heisenberg picture. So now I am perfectly uh, justified in making statements such as these which uh, basically tell you uh, the definition of the whole and particle Green's function. So this is the whole Green's function because I am first creating a hole and then filling the hole with a particle. So that is what 8.85 is. So now you see I, I can actually um, make physical sense out of the whole Green's function itself by uh, inserting the definitions of the time evolved creation and annihilation operator. So, which is what I have done here. So, if I do that, you see this now has the definition of uh, the overlap between the whole wave functions uh, 
at r and r dash and the whole wave functions remember are parameterized by the time at which the holes are inserted into the system. So, it is as if so the whole wave uh, the whole Green's function is basically the, uh, the quantum mechanical overlap between a whole wave function where you insert a hole at position r dash at time t dash and uh, when you insert uh, the hole instead at position r at time t. So, see when you insert at r and time t you get a certain whole wave function, but if you insert at r dash at time t dash you get a different whole wave function. So, the whole Green's function is basically the quantum mechanical overlap between these two states. So, which is what this is. So, quantum mechanical overlap means you take the complex conjugate of a of the second wave function multiply it by the first and then integrate over all the dynamical coordinates uh, namely the positions of the particles r1 r2 up to remember that having created a hole you have one fewer particle than what you started off with so you had n particles to begin with now you have n minus 1 so that is the reason why you are supposed to now in, instead of integrating over all n of them you are supposed to only integrate uh, up to n minus 1 because you have created a hole and there is one particle missing ok. So that is uh, the physical interpretation of the whole Green's function. So you can just pause a moment to think about what this means. So basically it means that uh, see this whole Green's function therefore has a very uh, intuitive physical meaning. It is just a quantum mechanical overlap between two situations. One is when you create the hole at r at t, the other is when you create the hole instead at r dash at t dash. So it asks you know how close are these wave functions I mean uh, how close are these two states you know so that so it it's a measure of the closeness of these these two operations so clearly you can imagine that if you create a hole at time uh, at r at time t and if you create a hole at instead at r dash at t dash and if r and r dash are very far apart or if t and t dash are very different then you can imagine that uh, the answer would be uh, uh, something uh, not at all close to unity because you see uh, the system would have uh, evolved a lot. So, the two are not the same right. So, because you are creating at very wildly different times or wildly different positions. So, it kind of is a measure of uh, uh, the havoc that a hole creates in the in a system. So, that is pretty much what it measures. So, similarly uh, you can uh, define a uh, the particle Green's function has a similar interpretation that uh, is the wave function of a system of uh, n particles to begin with and you create a particle that means you insert a particle at position r at time t and then suppose you instead insert at position r dash at time t dash the quantum mechanical overlap between these two states is basically uh, what the particle Green's function is because now you will have to in, uh, having inserted a particle you will have one more uh, dynamical variable position variable that you have to integrate over. So, instead of up to r n you have to integrate over uh, up to r n plus 1. Okay, so, this is as far as making contact with uh, more familiar uh, starting points such as the Schrodinger picture and so on. So, I have interpreted uh, you know this creation and annihilation operator and its time evolution uh, using uh, the familiar examples of quantum mechanical overlap of wave functions which are familiar from the Schrodinger's uh, approach to quantum mechanics. So, having done this now uh, I am equipped uh, to show you that you see uh, okay now now the question was what is the uh, utility of th this technique so remember what what is the suppose you ask the same question for uh, the original problem that i started off with in this chapter namely one mass tied to one spring what is the utility of using creation and annihilation operators there the utility clearly is that if you uh, there are many uses one of them 
one very obvious important use is that if you rewrite the Hamiltonian of the system in terms of creation and annihilation operators rather than working with position and momentum, you would clearly be able to read off the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. So, you would be able to read off the energy levels of the system just by staring at that Hamiltonian written down in terms of creation and annihilation operators. You would not have to struggle, you do not have to solve Schrodinger equation, you do not have to struggle with Hermite polynomials. I mean unless you want the wave functions, you do not have to struggle at all. So, the eigenvalues just drop out of the calculations all by themselves. So, even if you do not want them, they are there. So, that is the main advantage of working with creation and annihilation operators. It simply you know gives you the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian just like that. So, for the same reason, we now want to be able to express uh, a system uh, of n particles in terms of creation and annihilation operators of particles themselves rather than excitations, but uh, rather than in terms of the original picture, uh, original description in terms of position and momentum. So, uh, you see if uh, the original description was like this as shown in uh, equation 8.90. Now, I am going to try and convince you that uh, this Hamiltonian is nothing but this Hamiltonian, these two are the same so long as this operator acts on the on a Hilbert space containing n particles because you see this is sort of uh, this Hamiltonian is uh, agnostic uh, to the number of particles, agnostic means like it does not care about how many particles there are in the system. It is only when you act this operator on a state containing a fixed number of particles, then that dependence on the number of particles then shows up in the result of that action. So, therefore, I have to now, uh, so the claim is that 8.91 and 8.90 are operator identities, mean they correspond to the same operators provided. Uh, See here there are already n particles, so I am, I am not for I do not have to further qualify this by saying that uh, this 8.90 has to have n particle that is that is apparent just from the definition, but here it is not apparent. So, I have to specify that when 8.91 acts on a Hilbert space containing n particles, it is only then that these two become the same operator. So, the operator described in terms of creation and annihilation operator becomes precisely the same as the operator uh, that is described in terms of position and momentum. Okay, so, now I feel is a good time for me to stop because I in the next class I am going to prove this uh, rather startling but important claim. So, it is not at all obvious that you can do that. You see uh, the superficially this seems incredibly simple compared to this. Uh, so, 8.91 seems incredibly simple for the following reason because you see here uh, there are only two vectors r and r dash, but here you see how many vectors are there, there are n vectors and then n could be macroscopically large. So, if you have a system say if you have a typical uh, gas or if you have say electrons in a metal, you would have lot more than this. Okay. So, you would have uh, this many. So, this Hamiltonian has that many electrons and that many r vectors r 1, r 2 up to that, that many 10 raised to 30 r's, but then uh, this is formidably unwieldy. However, this even though the same information is contained in both, the uh, number of vectors that you have to deal with are only 2. Of course, that is uh, I mean you might think that that seems uh, implausible because then where is the information contained. Clearly, the, the, there is a hidden assumption that you are going to act this on finally on the appropriate number of you are going to act it on a state containing the appropriate number of particles which 
kind of uh, so that's where that information is hidden but nevertheless it is really uh, so you can imagine that from a formal standpoint for calculational purposes uh, 8.91 is uh, likely to be far more convenient in uh, doing uh, practical calculations than 8.90 because of the sheer number of vectors that you have to handle here because they are all mutually interacting by implication so these are uh, this is two body potential energy so they are mutually interacting so it's it's quite formidable but here uh, even though they are mutually interacting the number of vectors that you have to handle are a lot fewer okay so i'm going to stop here now and in the next class i'm going to prove this claim to you in significant detail okay thank you so hope uh, to see you in the next class Thank you.